This week on the Pro Wrestling Podcast, podcast. Ric Flair gives his thoughts on if CM Punk should be a WrestleMania opponent for Stone Cold Steve Austin. Is MJF a Dwayne The Rock Johnson level future megastar? Soraya shoots on getting her shit together with drugs, alcohol, and internet leaked videos. And I go on an epic rant about Captain Insano. I'm your host, Seth Grimes, and this is the Pro Wrestling Podcast Podcast. What the fuck is up, everybody? Welcome. Come on in. Come on in from the storm. We got bad weather up here in my part of the country. We're buried under like feet and feet of snow. Come on in. Kick your boots off. Relax. Welcome to the Pro Wrestling Podcast podcast. Welcome, everybody that's new. I had a big week last week with the Pro Wrestling content very grateful to everybody that has watched, everybody that's commented. A lot of great comments in there for the most part. Everybody's super cool. Lots of good uh, insight and other opinions to kind of dig into. I have made an effort to try to reply to every comment that I could. Um, so I appreciate all the longtime viewers and I appreciate all the new viewers. Welcome. I'm glad that you found me. I'm glad that you find entertainment and a chubby bearded fellow who has a love for wrestling. Uh, what we do here on the show is we don't talk about anything that happens inside the ring, at least for the most part, unless it's something just super crazy. But we're definitely not going to sit and talk about what happened on SmackDown last week or anything. What we're here to talk about is the pro wrestling podcasts and the shoot interviews and that kind of stuff. Conference calls, anything that happens outside the ring, I'm going to dip my toe in. And if I find it and I find it newsworthy or interesting or have a particular reason uh, that I want to talk about it, we're going to talk about it here on the pro wrestling podcast podcast. And yes, that last part of the word means that this is actually a podcast. So if you are watching or found me on YouTube, but you do listen to podcasts from time to time, please seek me out on all of your favorite podcast platforms. I do even post the video format of the show. So whether you like the video or audio, they're both there for you. Uh, but welcome. Well, we got a fun show to get into here today. Lots of stuff to talk about. Uh, before we do, if I could just quick bug you to please hit that subscribe button down below if you're watching on YouTube and like, follow and subscribe at Seth Grimes Media on social media platforms, Facebook, TikTok and Twitter. All that's out of the way. Let's jump into our first topic. <laughs> on to be the man, Ric Flair's podcast with son-in-law Conrad Thompson it was Ask Nate Anything, and they got to talking about the uh, probable matches for a Stone Cold Steve Austin return to the WWE. Uh, as we've heard, Stone Cold has been approached to have another match at WrestleMania, and he's already expressed. I covered this before, too, and nobody really picked up on it at the time. Uh, he was on some kind of beer podcast promoting his fucking his broken skull IPA or whatever. And he was asked about the wrestling WrestleMania appearance. And he said, yeah, I'd be open to another appearance because it was easy for him. He didn't take any bumps. He got paid a shit ton of money. He was the main event. And, and he went over and he's fucking and, and he barely, you know, he had to put in some work, but he didn't have to actually like put himself in physical jeopardy. He could do that shit all day long. Right. Um, so it was asked, you know, they were just speculating Conrad and Nate's were speculating who could be good opponents for a uh, stone cold Steve Austin return in the name of CM Punk inevitably came up. Of course, we all remember the uh, the and if you don't, you should seek it out. There was the uh, there was a 
WWE. I don't know if it was 2K at the time or if it was still with the previous whatever the fuck, but uh, uh, there was a WWE video game at the time coming out that had CM Punk on the cover. And CM Punk was the man at the time in WWE. I think he was the champion, actually. It was in his long run, um, the longest run until Roman Reigns uh, eventually beat it there. But Punk was the man at the time, and they had a sit down with Jim Ross, CM Punk, and Stone Cold Steve Austin. And it was it, it was like a hypothetical. What if these two could clash? So this is what Conrad brought up to Nate, you know, and Nate <laughs> didn't really hold back as he never does. Never known Nate to be uh, shy with words, have we? Check out this clip. I mean, his body is still great. He looks good. But he'll want to be knowing his ego and knowing who he is. He'll want to be stone cold. You know what I mean? And if he wrestles TM Punk, he needs to beat him in 30 seconds. Oh. So, so that's not the answer. Oh, wow. Okay. In 30 you... seconds. Stone cold Steve Austin's DM. But CM Punk, come on. Give me a break. Can't even mention your name in the same breath. Please. But, I mean, come on. I, and I, I don't mean this bad, but... CM Punk just can't, you know, act like he acts in one company and go to the other and act like that and come over and expect to be in the main event. He was in the main event at WrestleMania. You have a riot in the locker room. Think about it. He didn't leave on good terms. He's not leaving the other place on good terms. And they're rolling with Steve. I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not about his ability. I'm just talking about, the, you know, the, I can't even... I can't fathom the WWE even entertaining bringing a guy in that that would be putting him ahead of Styles, Orton. I mean, you could have Steve Russell, either one of those guys. You know, if Steve if if Steve can work, if his neck's okay, Steve is a working fool. Oh, for sure. He could wrestle Randy. I mean, you know, I mean, you you have guys jumping off the roof that brought Punk in there. Threw him in the main event of WrestleMania. I'm going to actually say Nate is right here. You know, at first, uh, because Nate kind of just dismissed it outright. He's like, punk, whatever, you know, as you heard in the clip there. Um, But then, you know, later on in the show, as you know, I played the whole thing in the clip, you know, all segments of this. But, you know, it was a little bit later that he had said, okay, you know, I, I don't mean that punk can't hang with Austin or doesn't deserve that spot. Uh, based on you know his abilities and skills and whatever it's just more like look at how he left wwe look at how he's was going on in aew right now and why would you want that guy in your locker room or to give him a big high profile spot like that that would piss a lot of people off right and actually nate is not wrong here i you know like i said i was a little bit like pissy with nate at first like of course punk deserved like not deserves, but can hang in the ring. With, you know, that's a big marquee star match. It's not like Punk is so far below Austin's level that it's like a ridiculous match, right? Um, it would be a huge match. But he's right that Punk just doesn't deserve that spot based on the way he left compared to guys that have earned that spot in the locker room right now. Um, he just, you know, the way he left WWE, the way he left AEW, and we don't even know what's going on with that quite yet at this point. But there's no you would piss off so many people if you were to bring in CM Punk to to take that kind of high profile spot at a WrestleMania card over other people on the roster that deserve it. You're you're fucking nuts. And this is coming from if you're a longtime listener of the show, I am a giant or was. I don't know. It's all it's all foggy right now. Uh, CM Punk Mark, right? I was an unabashed lover of CM Punk. I was at the first dance. I fucking, I, I just loved me some CM Punk. He was my hero. And now all this bullshit, I'm just, I, I'm kind of over it. You know what I mean? Like too far, too much. You know what I mean? And, and I don't think you reward that by giving that a high profile spot with uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin. So Nate is 100% right here. I agree with him fully. Uh, as to, you know, and, and you know what? I don't know that we'll ever even see. Uh, there's so many rumors out there that CM Punk is 
you know, I'm going to be going back to WWE or that Triple H is interested in WWE. And now the rumors are coming out that the WWE locker room saying, no, we don't want him here. Uh, all of these are just rumor, speculation, and bullshit. Punk's still signed to AEW, and the terms of his contract have not been worked out. So all of this is just speculation and nonsense anyway, but he's not going to go to WWE. Sam Roberts had the best uh, had the best approach to this. If they were to bring him in, don't sign him to any big contract. Sign him for, like, a couple matches, you know, like three three match a three match deal like a goldberg deal or something sign them to three matches a couple appearances before the matches boom 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 you know what i mean see how that goes for you and don't give them a high profile spot with like a stone cold as much as i would love to see it look that's a fucking dream match i'm not as a wrestling fan fucking take my money sorry off camera take my money but it's it's you are going to alienate your entire fucking locker room if you do that and you have to it's the same with bringing cm punk back to aew everybody's just like ah he's the biggest star though and drew the biggest pay-per-views and makes the most money you fuck the rest of the locker room you know you're in business not in fucking in friends yes but you don't want to piss off the whole rest of your locker room because of one guy no matter how big of a star that one guy is the whole rest of your locker room has to support that one guy. And if they don't want to be there or they don't like him, they're going to go elsewhere and you're going to have a hard time. Morale is going to be low. It's going to be a shitty place to work. Nobody's going to want to be there. You guys are fucking morons. If you fucking, if you think it's a good idea to alienate your entire locker room for one guy, even if he's going to make you a few extra million per year, it's not worth it because in the long run, it's going to kill your company. It's poison. It's locker room poison. It's the NWO in the WWE. I'm going to poison it. Inject it with a lethal dose. Um, Wouldn't it be dope if I turned around right now and I had NWO on the back of my chair? Oh, anyway. Um, <laughs> so who should face Stone Cold then? Well, Look, uh, Kevin Owens got the rub last year. I don't know if you go as like generic and low as like an Austin theory, but it wouldn't hurt to give some other guys a rub. What about a Seth Rollins? I bet you Seth freaking Rollins and Stone Cold. Stone Cold's been on record saying, I don't know what Seth freaking Rollins is. What's a Seth freaking Rollins? I don't get it. Rollins could bring that up. You know what I mean? He could bring that into play. Uh, you know, I'm just spitballing. Any, any of us could come up with. And then there's other like Cena, a general. I've, I pitched that. I think that would be amazing. Uh, you know, we already gave the rub to a younger guy. Not that Owens is young, but he's actually, you know, he's an active roster member. Right. So but why not do generation versus generation era versus era? Right. The fucking. The PG era or the fucking uh, ruthless aggression era, even John Cena versus the attitude era, Stone Cold Steve Austin. It was fucking that. That's where my money's at on this. But what do you think? I've ranted on this enough. What are your thoughts on CM Punk coming to the WWE? Who should face Stone Cold Steve Austin? And anything else I talked about, leave them in the comments below if you're watching on YouTube. I know I have podcast listeners, too, and you don't have that ability on a podcast, which is stupid. You should be able to comment on podcasts. That would be dope. Why not? But for those of you watching on YouTube, leave your thoughts down in the comments below, and let's have a conversation about it. MJF held court in one of AEW's famous post-show in-ring promos. This is where after the show, Tony Khan will come out and talk to the crowd, along with a couple of the top stars in the company. This is something they do at the end of every live event after the show goes off the air. Tony usually thanks the crowd and all that stuff. And the wrestlers just kind of shoot. You know, they talk to the crowd, air what's on their mind, whatever the fuck is, you know, is going on at the time. And oh boy, MJF came in and he fucking just held court like a pro, like he fucking owned the building. He had the crowd in the palm of his hand and he called Tony Khan out to the ring. Check out this clip. I'm just curious. Did you guys come here to AEW Dynamite to see John Moxley? <laughs> We are risking our lives. 
What MJF did right here shows me that he's going to get the ball and he's going to fucking run with it. Now, I'm recording this prior to full gear, so I don't know if MJF beat John Moxley for the world title or not. I am assuming he did, though, so let's talk about it like he did because that's exactly what this promo here set up. MJF is showing that he is the leader of this company. He is the top star. He's on the rise. I, I Last week, I did a segment on MJF getting the movie role to in the in the Von Eric movie. No, uh, you know, I did a lot of chatting about wrestling movies and the Von Erics and that kind of stuff along with that. In with that uh, clip, I, you know, I talked about how MJF is, is on a fucking rocket ship to the moon at this point. I see him on the same trajectory as the rock. I really, really do. I see him. He, he's, he's rising up as quick as the rock was at, at a young age. Like the rock was the way he controls the crowd. Even at, this was a baby face promo, but he was still a fucking heel the whole time. You know what I mean? Like, don't worry, Tony, I'm not going to shake you down for money again. But the crowd loves that stuff. Not only does it show that he has the ability to be the top guy and carry the company on his back and run with it, but it shows even more so what his baby face run will look like. Because make no mistake, he is a baby face now. He already is. Listen to that crowd. Did you come here to see John Moxley? Boo. Or did you come to see MJF? Yeah. You know what I mean? He got the crowd to chant Tony fucking Khan. Tony fucking Khan. Tony fucking Khan. I mean, come on, man. That's so cool. MJF's the shit. He's ready to take this company and run with it. If I were Tony fucking Khan, I would throw as much money as I, I would take some of that CM Punk money. And, and throw it at MJF at this point. Look, I was a stern believer that uh, because MJF is on his second contract in AEW, people don't, don't know that, or at least they don't appear to know that with their stupid fucking comments all the time. But MJF is not on the contract that he was when he came into AEW. You know, fresh off of MLW, fresh off the Indies, a hot prospect. Let's see what you got. Both him and Brit, Britt Baker. There might have been a couple others, but specifically MJF and Britt Baker were offered new contracts like after the first year, maybe not even like six months. Like as soon as like they were Tony without their contract running out, Tony Khan just said, here, you guys have proven yourselves to be the future of this company. I'm going to invest more in you. And, and a contract is a contract. You can say you've outgrown that contract and you're worth more now and you can have that conversation. But at the end of the day, you signed your name to agree to work here for this long, for this amount of money before you can re-up. But at this point, whatever they did to settle their grievances and whatever MJF got, I don't think he got a new contract. He might have just got you know bonuses or a fat bonus or something, but... 2024 throw the bank at mjf outbid wwe no matter what they are not by much but outbid wwe because uh you know mjf's young enough where he can still always go to wwe and when he does it'll be the biggest fucking jump of all time ever well maybe that's you know hyperbole because <laughs> the attitude era but um in recent times anyway it'll be probably bigger than cody was i guess is essentially what i'm getting at um, or anybody that ever came to AEW from WWE, it'll be huge. But if AEW, this whole thing, this promo here shows me that MJF can be a baby face with an edge like Stone Cold Steve Austin or The Rock, but different um, in that he ha he can he's ready to carry. the. This was a I'm the leader of the company speech. That's exactly what this was. This promo was, this is my company. I'm carrying it on my back. I'm a megastar. And, 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 and it was a pro AEW. He, like I said, he got the crowd chanting Tony fucking Khan. He put Tony over like a million bucks, right? MJF, at least till 2024, is, is a team player, you know, for this coming year. He's gonna he's going to be the man in AEW. And I think Tony Khan should pretty much do everything it takes up to and including 
firing other people to make contract money available to keep MJF. And I'm not saying make him the richest man in wrestling. You know what I mean? Like he's not the rock yet, but you invest in him. Like he's your top star at this point. Not like he's an up and coming star, whatever you're willing to pay your top star, you know, CM Punk money, Chris Jericho money, that kind of money. That's what you want to be paying people. That's what you're going to be paying MJF. You know how every single match that John Moxley has ever, he bleeds unless he's in like a state that has like an athletic commission that forbids it. And he just bleeds everywhere. And that's what he does. You ever wonder what his pretty beautiful, uh, innocent, sweet little wife thinks about John Moxley coming home with gig marks in his forehead, covered in blood, fucking tax sticking out of his back and glass and barbed wire. Well, wonder no more because Renee Paquette was on the busted open podcast and she talked with Dave and Mickey and Tommy dreamer about what it's like to be the wife of a fucking masochist like John Moxley. Check out this clip. Can you explain as a spouse of someone? Because John, he brings it every single night. He does it on the indies. I say like sometimes like, why is he doing these things? And that's coming from me and I'm nuts. There's two sides to this because I, you know, I get asked about that a lot, about what it's like being married to John and the things that we all see him put his body through, what he puts other people's bodies through. And yeah. Certainly there's times I'm like, oh, my God, that I am like preparing the text to send to him for when he walks back to the locker room after the match. I'm just like, please stop licking people's blood. What is like the stuff on the outside, the apron, like some of these things that I want to like get up his ass about. Um, There's definitely that side that exists. But on the other side, there's being the wife of a man that is so incredibly passionate, like the rarity of people to find the passion for the thing that they love and then get to execute that to the absolute highest degree is very rewarding for me to be able to see him do. Whether it's him main eventing a pay-per-view in Newark, New Jersey uh, as the AEW world champion, or if he's doing something in Japan, or he's running an indie show out in Seattle with Defy, like whatever it may be that he's out there doing, there's always this different as much as I can be waiting at the door to be like, oh my God, I can't believe you were bleeding and this happened and da, 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 da. The man that walks back in through the door is so excited and so happy about what he has just done to see like that passion to that level is it honestly, like without sounding so cheesy, it really inspires me. What a fucking gem Renee Paquette is. Honestly, like she's one of my favorite wrestling personalities my favorite people in wrestling uh, amongst pretty much anybody honestly she's got to be like my top five wrestling personalities she's just fucking just charming as all hell right she's cool she's fun uh and she gets it and she understands and look i mean to have a wife like that fucking hot successful smart cool and she's not like a snob you know what i mean like she got this fucking balding ass, fucking bleeding, gig marked up fucking husband. And she just adores this man. She fucking loves her some John Moxley. And I respect that so much. The fact that she doesn't care that the fact that she's just happy that he's out there living his passion. I mean, look, this is a guy who has said, even if AEW didn't exist, he wouldn't be in WWE. I mean, he might be back there by now with Triple H in charge, but he would have been happy just going out and doing fucking garbage matches on the indies. Let's be frank. If AEW didn't exist and let's, let's assume that GCW still continued its trajectory he most likely would be a full-time GCW guy and doing other indies and shit like that. But he'd be a garbage match, fucking bum indie mud show wrestler. Right, Cornette fans? Um, by the way, I know I, I know there's a lot of Cornette fans. I, I checked my analytics, and it actually shows you, like, what other videos people that watch your videos watch. And, like, almost all of them are Jim Cornette videos. So I appreciate that because you're a smart audience. People that listen to Cornette are, are brilliant, um, you know, well-educated, smart people. So um, thank you, 
<laughs> anyway, uh, back to the story. Yeah, Moxley, uh, he's a fucking, he'd be a shit bum indie wrestler. And Renee would love him nonetheless. I, I have every reason to believe that Renee is not a gold digger. She's not, uh, you know what I mean? She's not, uh, even though I think I, I read somewhere that Moxley's net worth is like $10 million. Uh, I'm sure it's close. He was paid well in WWE and he was paid even weller in AEW and uh, weller, uh, Peter Weller. Um, <clears throat> and and he's you know, he's got fuck you money for sure because he walked away from uh, pro- what, what by all accounts would be probably an insane offer from WWE to stay. You know, he said he didn't even look at it, so I'm not sure what the exact number is, but uh, maybe he did. Yeah, I think he did say it was. Yeah, it was ridiculous money, but it doesn't matter. The fact that Renee just to wrap a fucking bow up on this is is such a loving, caring, awesome, cool, uh, just just a fucking gem. Such a good wife for Moxley. She don't care. She understands. And not only that, but she knows that he's a professional. And she, of course, will worry that he's going to get hurt as anybody would, right? You know, you always worry about your loved ones, no matter what they do. You worry about them driving to work in the morning in case they get in a car accident. But she trusts that Mox is uh, at the very top level of this business, knows exactly what he's doing. And if he's going to bleed or take a bump into tax or barbed wire, he's going to do it. Better than anybody else is going to do it. Smarter, more careful, maybe. I don't know. But I uh, just wanted to share this with you because I, I always kind of wondered that. I do, honestly. Like, I look at a woman like Renee, and I just, I think she's just the perfect woman, to be 100% honest with you. Because, I mean, I could just go on and on about her, right? You know, as far as, like, wife material. And then you look at a guy like Moxley, and, and he's so... So, so opposite you know what i mean i, I he just he's so, so rough and like just i don't know i can't put a you understand what i'm saying i can't necessarily put words to it here uh grizzled and just you know bleeding every he just they're they're they don't look like they would uh appeal to each other but i just fucking love it love hearing it and was always curious what a woman like that thought about her husband come every time he bleeds on TV. I'm like, when he's fucking 60, he's gonna have uh you know, he's gonna have old timer forehead, like like uh Bruiser Brody had, or like fuck maybe not to the extent of Abby or 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 uh New Jack or something, but he's he's gonna be pretty ugly, you know what I mean? And uh she's just a peach. God bless Renee Paquette. Captain Insano is back and people are losing their shit about this. Now, I don't normally make a habit of talking about stuff that happens inside the ring on this show. This show is uh, strictly for podcasts, shoot interviews, that kind of stuff. Um, But this one, I, I just wanted to jump in and give my two cents on because I see people on the Internet and it just makes me shake my head and I don't understand There's, you know, Captain Insano made his debut as part of a a music video with the acclaimed on AEW. And all of a sudden, like, everybody's just like, oh, my God, this is the beginning of the end. Uh, Was Vince McMahon booking this shit? Oh, Big Show is such a joke now. Laughable. Oh, everybody was so mad. He was buried in WWE. And now look at him. Ha, ha, ha. What a joke. Um. What the fuck, man? Are you guys not capable of having a good time? Are these the people that that like their chicken with no flavor? Like you just fucking just dry, just no sauce, no seasoning, no nothing because you just got to get the protein in. These are serious motherfuckers, right? Have a laugh. This wasn't a match. This wasn't an angle. This isn't like he's not going for the world title. And it's not anything that they're pushing on him. This is something that he wanted to do for nostalgia's sake. Him and Tony Khan talked about it and wanted to bring this character back. He was excited about it. I did a fucking uh, segment on it like half a year ago or whenever that was announced that uh, they got the trademark for Captain Insano. Why is everybody so upset about this? 
Like, honestly, like go watch fucking 1980s NWA or fucking Jim Cornette's Smoky Mountain Wrestling or better yet, go watch the UFC. It's completely believable, realistic, right? No funny business, no jokes, no skits and 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 completely sports like it's completely up your alley you'll love it right watch the ufc fuck off man like have a laugh wrestling is believe it or not wrestling needs to be a variety show it's a two-hour show with millions of people watching okay a million or less for aew but millions for wwe right uh this you need to appeal to everybody watching all right. There's clearly not more than a million diehard. I like wrestling fans. Otherwise, they would have otherwise Ring of Honor would have been bigger than it was. Right. Because that was pretty pure wrestling. They even have a title called the Pure Wrestling Championship sports like product. Right. NWA. Go watch the NWA. Right. That's Billy Corgan's big thing now is. I want big, burly, believable guys, you know, like when I was a kid, all the big guys could beat up the little guys. And, you know, that's what I want. So in a nutshell, that's what he said. Go watch that. Then clearly you don't like entertainment. You want to watch UFC, but fake UFC, right? You don't want to watch UFC. You want to watch pretend UFC, but you want it to be as UFC ish as possible, right? As sports based as realistic that's just not what wrestling is anymore okay uh if you're an older fan who grew up in the 70s and 80s i respect uh, early 80s you know before hulkamania and stuff um you know i respect where you're coming from but wrestling has changed since the ufc came around wrestling is more entertainment than it is sport it's just a fact ufc has shown what real wrestling that's that's pro wrestling If WWE, if pro wrestling was a real thing, it would be UFC, right? Guys from different backgrounds, different skill sets, different sizes, shapes, countries. You know, some people have characters and stuff. You know, some people with the the big furry fucking head. You got your Conor McGregor walking like McMahon. Like, we have characters. It's UFC. Go watch that. Okay. You know, they do angles and stuff. Um, but otherwise wrestling is going to have entertainment. It's going to have goofy spots from time to time, and it's going to use weapons because they're allowed to, and they're going to have fun characters. And this was not even in a match. Okay. I can, I can understand if you're like, Oh, captain insano is going for the AEW title. What a, what a joke. Yeah. Absolutely. When he appears along with the acclaimed who are fucking clowns anyway, they're the new age outlaws 2.0. I don't mean clowns in a negative way. I love the acclaimed. Everybody loves the acclaimed, right? But it's still, it's still, there's still comedy. You know, he comes out and busts raps to make people laugh and go, oh shit. Oh, you know, like the scissor me daddy ass. Like you can't, you can't tell me that putting captain insano in with them is is fucking bad booking you 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 don't have a sense of humor at this point that's all it is or you have a completely delusional idea of what pro wrestling is or should be or you're hanging on to the past and what it was right this isn't the smoky filled fucking sportatorium anymore with grandmas coming over the railing trying to fucking stab people because because god damn it you know what i mean like it's entertainment. It's a show. You are watching a show and WWE does far more silly shit. And honestly, if somebody over there would have thought of the idea to bring Captain Insano back, they would have did it. And you guys probably would have not been so hard on it because you love to hate AEW on top of everything else. This was something Big Show wanted to do. This wasn't something that Tony Khan forced on him. It might have been Tony's idea, but Big Show was excited about this. And it's it's fun to have, you know, I said when I did, uh, you know, when that trademark was announced and I talked about it, you know, about a half a year ago or so, um, you know, I mentioned that a good idea, a good use for this character is video games and and merchandising and, you know, Captain Insano T-shirts and action figures and, uh, you know, a unlockable character in in the video game. These are smart uses for a Captain uh, Insano, I almost said Captain America, 
Um, America's ass. Um, that's a great use for Captain Insano, but you know what else is a great use for Captain Insano, which will help sell those T-shirts and action figures and stuff because he's on TV again, is putting him in a fucking skit with the acclaimed. All right. He's not chasing the title. He's not beating anybody important. He's it's it's a silly fucking comedy sketch in between matches. And you know, look, Bruce Pritchard always talks about the let me up moments, right? The the fucking you can't have serious match after serious match after so you gotta have let the audience breathe a little, let them have a little bit of a laugh before you get into something serious again. Like the idea that this is stupid or this is the end of AEW or this is the end of big show or what a joke. Like, I don't know what you guys want from your wrestling, but you're, you're hate watching at this point because you're not getting it from WWE and you're not getting it from AEW because both of them do silly clown shit. Dan Housen, orange Cassidy, fucking all the silly shit. Seth Rollins was doing or the bro. You know, all his goofy skits backstage and just uh, Nikki A.S.H., even though they changed that now. But you could go on and on and on and on, and on about the, the clown show, goofy, silly comedy set, the comedy sketches and segments in between matches. And in a two hour wrestling show on national television with a million plus viewers or right around a million, you know, for AEW, you have to you have to appeal to a wider audience. You cannot appeal to the niche fucking 1970s NWA wrestling fans that want to believe. Damn it. I want to believe it's real. You know, Jim Cornette always says this phony fake bullshit. Who are you trying to fool in 2022? Who are you trying to pull the wool over anybody's eyes for? And look, everybody knows wrestling's a work, right? As long as you don't do it in the main event, as long as MJF and J and John Moxley aren't doing silly clown shoe shit where it's fake, phony nonsense, I get where you're coming from there. But if you want to add a comedy segment in between a match with fucking Captain Insano, which is a huge nostalgia fucking it's nostalgia. People loved that movie and people still to this day, there's memes about Captain Insano. He's remembered. It's a memorable character. What? 20 years later, people remember that shit. Why not make money off of it? You guys are insane. I don't know what you want in wrestling. I suggest you go to the WWE Network. You pull up the old fucking NWA stuff, the old Smoky Mountain stuff, you know, fucking, you know, Texas fucking wrestling shit and just watch some of that stuff or go be a UFC fan. It's very realistic. You'll love it. They don't do anything silly or goofy or phony. It's believable. You know, uh, I, I don't know what else to tell you. You're hate watching at this point. Get a life. Soraya continues to make her rounds on the media circuit, and she did insight with Chris Van Vliet this week. A lot of the same stuff she's been talking about uh, in some of these other interviews. And, you know, it's a lot of repeat stuff from the interview with Renee that I did cover last week. So I'm not going to retread that stuff. I've covered her injury and her getting cleared. I've covered her, you know, the fan hatred towards her for a promo. But one thing I don't think we've gotten in depth enough about with Soraya here is a lot of the stuff that she went through earlier on in her career with the partying and the the drinking, the drug use, the Alberto Del Rio shit, and of course the infamous videos. You know the ones. You know the ones. You've watched them. Check out this clip. <laughs> I know you have, and if you haven't, you should go seek them out. Um, but uh, with all that, do you think? Do you think there will be pictures of Jizz on the AEW Women's Championship? Do you think? You think if she wins the uh, TBS title, there will be cum shots all over the TBS logo? How do you think TBS will like that? I digress. Check out this clip of Chris Van Vliet talking with Soraya and asking her, did anybody ever step in and tell you to chill the fuck out? Check out this clip. Did somebody tell you, like, you got to get everything together here, Paige, uh. Soraya? So WWE were really fantastic. I mean, they were helping me and they were keeping me updated and they were texting me and just, just constantly like 
sending out like that olive branch of like, we want to help you, like, let us help you. And at the time I didn't listen to people because I didn't think that I could be helped. I was like, you can't help the person that doesn't want to be helped. And I didn't want to be helped at the time yeah. either. And so um, I was just going through a whole lot, you know, the first surgery, all the public stuff that came out, the videos that came out. And I was just at completely rock bottom. Like it was fucking awful time in my life. Like, and I said to my, I said to myself, I was like, I was like in a bush outside of Walmart, right? When these videos came out, like I ran out of my house and I just started running and I don't know why I was running, but I was running. And I got to like Walmart and then I hid in a bush. And I don't know why, but I just felt so humiliated that I was out there on the fucking internet for people to see. And no one was ever supposed to see those. You know, I was 19, you know. And I just remember being so low at that point and saying like to myself, if my dad doesn't accept me in this, my dad's opinion of me mattered so much, you know, I probably wouldn't be here today. Mm. is how bad it was and uh, I remember calling him and I was absolutely just said I'm like I'm so sorry you know I was completely fucking heartbroken I was like I'm so sorry um and he straight away was like I don't care and I was just like what he was like I don't care he was like look at Kim Kardashian <laughs> I was like dad <laughs> after that I just remember feeling like a lot of weight coming off my shoulders Although publicly, people would recognize me and say the meanest shit. Like Twitter was real life for a second, which Twitter is not usually real. Like people would hurling fucking shit at me. I remember one time I was sitting at a bar with my friends and someone asked for like a picture or something like that. And I was like, yeah, like, can we get it afterwards? I'm just like going to eat my food and then totally we can, we can have it, right? Because I was in the middle of eating. And then he was just like, I only want it because you're a fucking porn star. You know, but yeah, so he called me, this guy called me a fucking porn star. And like, it was the first time hearing it in public, like someone saying that to me. And usually it's just on social media and I have control of that because I can just delete it off my phone, right? Yeah. But having that in person, I like ran to the bathroom and I started sobbing. Now, look, by the way that I opened this video, it might sound like I'm being hard on Soraya and I'm really not. Um, look, we've all done some silly shit. I think a lot of people forget how young Soraya is. She's literally only 30 now. Like if she was DDP, she wouldn't even have gotten into the wrestling business yet. You know what I mean? So like she's young as shit. And look at the life that she's led already. Look at the career that she's had already. Um, you know, she's like on her CM Punk return tour right now, and she's only 30 years old uh, and supposedly 100 percent cleared. So she's got a long ways to go. And, you know, as I was saying, anyway, people forget how young she really was. And people do a lot of stupid shit when they're young. My God, if if I was a celebrity and the things that I've done got out to the world good lord you know in my rap days i was i was a vulgar rowdy rapper you know i said some ridiculous shit uh in songs you know a la eminem you know not not necessarily his style but the way that he just says ridiculous things that just make it but in a jokey way you know what i mean uh so i did a lot of that stuff that would surely get me canceled if any of that came up um <laughs> The uh, it's actually all on my YouTube channel. You can just go look for it yourself if you'd like to, if you're really that interested. Um, but then, you know, I, fuck, we've all snorted a line of coke off some fat bitch's ass crack, right? Right? No? Well, I did. I mean, shit happens when you're younger, right? There may or may not be a photo of my penis out there with a Santa Claus hat on it. Look, people do stupid shit, okay? So especially when they're young, you got to give her a pass on this and just let it go. Give her a fresh start. She's got a new name. She's in a new company. It's been several years. Let's not carry any of this baggage over with her. Um, I know there's a contingency of WWE fans that are just mad at her because she's not in WWE anymore. And those people aren't going to be pleased at all. These are the same people that want to cancel you on the Internet because you disagree with them. Right. You're just never going to please some people. Uh, but for the rest of us, let's not judge Paige. Let's not judge Soraya by what Paige did when she was 
19, 20, 21, 22. I mean, seriously, guys, like you have to put it into context. And she's clean now. She's sober now. Um, her, by all accounts, her life is in good shape. She's doing well. She's she's got her shit together. And let's give her a chance. If she fucks up again, she pulls a Jeff Hardy. Like you know, I was very hard on Jeff Hardy because you know I said the same shit about him, and then he did me dirty. Not me personally, but like us as fans, you know, that forgave him and gave him another chance. He fucked up again. If Paige does that, Soraya does that. Um, then, you know, you can have your opinions of her again. But I think collectively, it's not a horrible idea if we were to all just try to give her another chance to just be a new person, have a fresh start and see what she brings to the table in this new era. That big, handsome hunk of man Wardlow was on the wrestling podcast with Brandon Walker this week. Wardlow on the show to promote the upcoming full gear pay-per-view, which by the time you hear this probably already happened. But as I record this on a Saturday afternoon, the show is later tonight and I don't know who won. Um, but Wardlow going in the TNT champion and he was on the show to promote the show. They got into all kinds of fun things on the show. This was actually a really cool episode of wrestling. Wardlow's getting better at doing the interviews. He's still a little bit uptight. Uh, he's still trying to he's having trouble coming out of his shell a little bit. Uh, but he's getting better. A lot of earlier, you know, I remember very early on on this show, I reviewed uh, an interview that Warlow did, and it was just awful. You know, he was very stiff and awkward and cold and wasn't really sure how to handle interviews. And he's getting much better at that. He's still coming out of his shell. Uh, but Brandon Walker did a good job of helping. Brandon was fucking with him the whole time. Uh, you know, if you're familiar with the wrestling podcast, Brandon Walker will just... He, he runs his show like a train wreck, even though it's not. And he's a professional and all. But his show, it's just like the style of the show is it's just a complete awkward mess. And uh, he was fucking with Wardlow pretty good on this show. Um, but I think it was just to kind of get him to come out of his shell a little bit. And I think he did. I think he did. And it was in this particular clip here. We got some insight into what Wardlow sees for himself in the future as uh, Brandon Walker asked Wardlow who his dream opponent would be. And this was his answer. Check it out. Who is your uh, dream opponent in wrestling? If I could just pick an opponent out of a hat and put him in the ring across from you, what do, what do your dreams at night tell you? Brock Lesnar. Brock Lesnar. Yeah. That would be awesome. It would be awesome. That would be awesome. <laughs> Brock Lesnar's... The real deal. He's a he's a beast. Yes, I feel like you think that's you wrestle him? the ultimate. Did you beat him? <laughs> Absolutely, I think that's the ultimate testament. I think at the in the in the game of professional wrestling, it's Lesnar and Wardlow. I'm gonna text Brock right now and tell him that you're challenging him. Let him know. Give see, him my number. See how that works. Well, I don't have his number. Um, it would be awesome if I did though. It would be awesome. That would be cool. Um. You know Nickelback's going to be here in a minute. What? You know, first of all, just a note on Brandon Walker uh, for the Wrestling Podcast here, the fellow who interviewed Wardlow. Uh, this is a part of Bart Barstool Sports. That's what the Wrestling Podcast is on. And uh, Brandon has expressed in the last couple podcasts that Barstool has not been bringing him in as much that uh, they're only kind of flipping him the budget to do shows here and there instead of his weekly show, which he had originally been running. Maybe the numbers are down. I don't know. I don't pay attention to that. But what I do know is I love me some Brandon Walker. I think he's a fantastic interviewer. Um, if you go and you read the comments uh, in those any video that he does, you'll see that he has a very solid, supportive fan base that loves his interviews as well. And he's always super fun. His interviews are just awkward and outside the box and silly and funny. And he just gets a different interview out of guys. They're more relaxed. They're more they're they're laughing. You know, he's always cracking jokes at the expense of himself or fucking with the talent a little bit. And it just makes for a fun 
uh, interview, and I hope that he gets the chance to do more. If not, I hope he finds his way out of uh, whatever deal he's got with Barstool Sports and that he can go out and just kind of do his own thing because I think he has not only the connections and the talent and the fan base to do it all on his own, um, but, you know, I would certainly be there to support him. Uh, as for Wardlow, so please absolutely go watch. He did a couple interviews. He announced that he had one with Jade Cargill. I don't know. I haven't checked as of today if it came out yet or not. I assume it's going to come out before full gear. So it probably has hit today, but I didn't get a chance to you know, watch it in time to do this show. But he did one with Tony Khan, which was also great. Anytime he has Tony on, anytime he has MJF on too. Um, they're just great interviews, you know. Wardlow was a classy guy. Wardlow, I expect to see big, big things out of. Like I said, he's still kind of coming out of his shell doing these media things, but I see him getting better and, and really like honestly, whether they're progressing slowly or they're progressing fast, if you can noticeably see that they're progressing, you fucking you continue to invest in them, right? Wardlow is a big, beefy monster of a man. Sexy as all hell, right? Like, just, I mean, come on. Look at the guy. Um, million bucks. He's like Batista 2.0. He's younger, uh, more athletic. He's he's smart, very smart, very well-spoken. Uh, you know, he's got to loosen up a little bit, get a more experience in the ring. And I see this guy being a fucking megastar. I don't, there's not, there's nothing in the, nothing about Warlow that makes me look at him and go, ah, mid Carter, you know, he's not fucking, he's not Kona crush. He's not Adam bomb. You know, he's not Brian cage. He's not just some big random beefy guy that that's just going to get lost in the mix somewhere. Warlow is probably destined to God damn. I wouldn't, I would not be surprised to see him have a WrestleMania main event in the future someday. And that's just me. Some of y'all might be like balking at that, but I don't know. I've been around the business long enough. I, I recognize not only recognize talent, but I recognize what types of talent and in what ways that companies like WWE, for example, look for what kind of, what do they look for in these kind of talents that they bring in and what do they do with them when they have them if they're worth half a shit warlow is worth half a shit he's a fucking beast he's a machine he's a nice guy he's cool as all fuck he's gotta get a little bit more of a personality going he is kind of dull he, he he strikes me as a very nice very very well-spoken meathead you know what i mean like i don't know that there's a lot of a lot of deepness there under the sur even that was kind of uh something Brandon was having fun with how I was saying he was fucking with him and stuff. Like he'd ask Wardlow, what's your favorite movie? What's your favorite music? And the answers that that Wardlow was given, it was just Brandon was just like so disappointed in him <laughs> every time he gave an answer, you know. Wardlow's like, ah, I'm sorry, you know, is this generic man answers? Like, yeah, yeah, pretty much generic meathead man answers. You know, there's no depth there, but hey, that's just me judging on a surface level. You know, he could be incredibly deep for all I know, but even if he's not just the big, handsome, muscly meathead fucking just powerhouse that destroys people in the ring. Uh, he's young. He, I'm sure, takes takes uh, direction very well. Uh, I just see a world of potential for this guy. No, I don't think he's going to be like the next megastar or anything. You know, I, I don't know that he'll achieve the levels that Batista did, but I do see him very much in the same vein as Batista. And I do think the potential is there. Um, if you were to work hard and, and take those opportunities when they present themselves. Bruce Pritchard was talking with Conrad Thompson on something to wrestle with this week. And they were talking about the macho man. Ooh, yeah, macho man and Elizabeth. And uh, we've heard these stories a million times, even on something to wrestle. We've heard these stories a million times. Uh, but this episode was on Miss Elizabeth. Um, but during the conversation, they got to talking about how Randy got his start in his father's promotion, which was widely considered to be an outlaw territory 
in the uh, Memphis area where Memf- the Memphis territory was running strong. Uh, the Poffle family outlaw mud show promotion was running in the same area. And that got Bruce to talking about the uh, what exactly what is a mud show and how does that relate to the greater NWA and what the exact organizational structure of the NWA was and was there really any extra value to being in the NWA? Check out this clip. But let's go back to the term because I think some people don't really understand what does outlaw promotion mean? I've always been of the mindset that wrestling back in the day was almost ran like the mafia. There were different territories and the governing body of these quote unquote five families, if you will, to make up mafia references, the NWA. So if you ran opposed to an existing territory and didn't play by the rules, you were an outlaw promotion or you weren't a member of the NWA, you were an outlaw promote. Talk me through what the difference is. Well, no, the outlaw, an outlaw promotion is if you have a, a promotion and you have an established territory that you've been running for many years where you have television and you've got a crew of, of guys going through there and someone comes into your market, puts their television show on, on the air in your market, in your area, and then starts running shows. That's an outlaw promotion. That is what was viewed in outlaw promotion. Had nothing to do with the NWA and all that bullshit. The NWA was a crock of shit. I mean, when you really get down to it, man, it was a monopoly that, that just, they charged promoters to be able to put those three letters, you know, say, hey, we're members of the NWA. You know, Fritz was the president of the NWA when he realized that, this is stupid. Right. Uh, I'll make my own world champion. And, you know, I'm going to go with my kids and, and I'll make my own world champion. I'll have my own promotion. I don't need the NWA. Watts didn't need the NWA. Very few, you know, you go up in California. Roy Shires was, you know, like, what the fuck do I need an NWA champion for? Right. It's silly. Um, but the NWA, you know, had this, this thing and it had the aura of, being this uh, governing body, they didn't govern shit. They didn't even make sure that their champion made the shows on, you know, that they were advertised for, but by God, they wanted to get their points on whatever show you ran. This was actually educational to me because I did not grow up in the NWA era. I grew up in the WWF Vince McMahon expansion era where all the territories were shutting down um obviously you know i'm a well-studied well-researched wrestling fan i've seen all the documentaries read books you know i am aware of the territories pretty well uh but something that i guess i never really had the bigger picture on was what exactly was the point of even being in the nwa what what would you like I guess I uh, thought there was more to it than there actually was. And uh, Bruce kind of just shit on it, which was fun. It was fun to listen to Bruce kind of shit on the NWA a little bit. Sounds like other than just having rights to the NWA traveling champion and, uh, you know, in, in avoiding other people coming into your territory or something like that, you know, like being considered an outlaw mud show too, or being ran out. Um, you know, basically there was no point, you know, you're just signing up to give away money essentially is what you're doing. Be part of the good old boys club. Now I'm sure Bruce was kind of, uh, undervaluing it to a certain extent. You know, I'm sure there were situations where it wasn't just the traveling NWA champion. I'm sure there were, you know, this was the network where promoters were reaching out to other promoters and trading talent and making deals with them. Now, certainly they could have did that same thing with the mud shows. And even if it wasn't an outlaw promotion, look at Vince McMahon uh, left the, the NWA Vince senior, you know, they were the WWF was an NWA territory at some point. Um, I believe the AWA left the NWA territory at some point. Um, everybody just kind of broke off and said, fuck it. We'll, we'll start our own world champion, you know, and worked out fine for a lot of them. Um, but, you know, maybe some of the smaller promotions needed 
the association with the NWA. Hell, all the way up into the 2000s, all the way up till Billy Corgan bought the fucking thing or when TNA had the NWA TNA, they were using the NWA stuff in TNA. Uh, T- uh, NWA was still out there uh, collecting dues from regional territories. Um, you know, I come from the uh, Michigan, Wisconsin uh, territorial era. And I know that uh, there was NWA Wisconsin for quite a while. Uh, there was an association there. And then it just, you know, eventually dissolved because people are paying money for for nothing, essentially, for the NWA letters and, and whatnot. Um, beyond that, like I said, I'm sure, you know, it would it would prevent like mafia in a way, you know, you're paying your dues. It's going to avoid us coming for you. I imagine if you were an outlaw territory uh, trying to work outside the NWA system, it was possible you could be pushed out of your territory or wrestlers would be blackballed if they worked for you and things like that. I'm sure all of that kind of stuff happened amongst the territories, both NWA and outside the NWA. Um, but it was a good little education. And look, I take everything Bruce says with a grain of salt. Like I said, I'm sure there were other little perks along the way other than the traveling NWA champion. But I never heard it put quite the way that Bruce did, where it's just like, eh, who gives a shit? <laughs> so I thought that was a fun little thing to share because it educated me. So uh, maybe that'll, uh, you know, because I think, you know, we've seen so many documentaries and stories told about how the territories were ran back in the day. And I think, you know, and then you hear about the outlaw shows and it's just kind of wonders what's the difference and why does it even matter? Well, kind of laid it out for you there. Bruce laid it out on something to wrestle. Um, that was the one thing I kind of wanted to cherry pick from this, you know, uh, he had a lot of other great stuff about Liz and Mach, but it's all stuff we've heard before. There's nothing groundbreaking in there or anything particularly newsworthy. Just a good, fun little episode if you are a fan of Miss Elizabeth and really the Macho Man as well, because they basically talked about his whole career in the WWE again, just from Liz's angle instead of Mach's. <laughs> That's it. That's all we got. That is the end of our show. I want to thank you guys for sticking around again. I I just, I I don't have enough thanks to give for the growth that I'm seeing. I'm still super small level. You know, when I say growth, like I haven't even hit a thousand subscribers on YouTube yet. That is my goal. I am working towards, but man, I passed 500 last week and I'm already like, north of 550 you know what i mean so like working my way up towards 600 already i'm gonna get that thousand maybe not by the end of the year um but you know definitely uh by the end of next year i'm gonna be monetized and that's gonna allow me to do more things at that point i'm gonna branch out you know you can't even pin a little t-shirt store down below till you have till you're monetized have the thousand subscribers It's all very important. So if you're watching on YouTube and listening to the end here, or even if you're just listening on podcasts, but you have YouTube, uh, please throw me a subscribe, man. It helps me out so much. It helps me more than you could ever freaking know at this point, um, because uh, I'm trying to grow this to the point where I can just do this full time, not just the pro wrestling podcast, um, but you know, other content, you know, I'm in this for the long haul and, and I appreciate every single person that hangs out with me, um, because I know, you know, the, the internet world is divisive out there. I know half the people that listen to what I say out there on the internet, uh, might disagree with me or just not like my fucking face or my voice or who knows. So I appreciate every single person that I have that listens to this show Anybody subscribing, liking, following, interacting, or just just listening, just clicking play, even for one video, it just means the absolute world to me. So thank you so much, and uh, continue to throw a guy a bone, and I will continue to throw content your way, including bonus content. I am planning to do more bonus content, you know, as as of last week. Uh, I was talking about how at the time of recording the Royal Rumble video, I did a Royal Rumble watch along for the 1992 Royal Rumble, and it was blocked at the time, a copyright block at the time that I had recorded it. 
Um, but that has since been lifted. I disputed it and it has been lifted. So that is live and that's out there. And uh, it was super fun to do. And it seems like the people that watched it liked it. And so I think I'm going to continue to do more. There was enough interest that I think if I do more, it'll continue to grow. So I'm probably going to do some more watch alongs as well for wrestling content. Not always huge Royal Rumbles and stuff, you know, a full hour long show, though. People like those long form contents, but I'll do some short form contents, too. I'll do like a match, you know. Um, we'll do some fun stuff. I got lots of stuff planned, especially going into the new year. You know, you always start the new year fresh and uh, with lots of excitement and lots of new ideas and that sort of thing. So also follow some of my other content on YouTube. If you're on YouTube watching this or, you know, like I said, you have a YouTube account and you're a podcast listener, go check out some of my other stuff. I do reaction videos to music videos, movie trailers, other random shit. I got lots of I got a, a good handful of movie reviews up now as well. I did a bunch of horror reviews over the month of October and uh, planning some other stuff in that regard as well. I'm just I'm doing as much as I can with the time that I have. I want you to know that this is fun for me. It, this this part, just sitting and talking to the camera and the microphone is the funnest part, to be honest with you. Editing can get tedious sometimes, uh, but it makes it worth it. You know, when you see, you know, a thousand people watched your video after it's like, OK, that was worth the time and effort that I put into it, even though it's not monetized yet. It's worth getting those eyeballs and, and getting those interactions from people and the subscribers. And I, I just love it. Um, but this is fun just sitting, talking, wrestling with you guys. Like I could talk wrestling all day long. Another thing, once I'm monetized, I plan to start going live. Uh, that's something I'm going to be busting out in the near future. Certainly sometime in 2023, um, I'm going to start to do some live streams and, and where we can just chat about random shit you know, and just take questions. We can talk wrestling or maybe I'll talk, you know, long form about other subjects. I don't know yet. I haven't fully thought it through. I just know I love sitting here and talking with you guys. So um, and I love when you interact. I know I've said that earlier, but just just interact more. Throw me some comments. You know, I will respond to as many as I can. Just don't be a dick. If you're a dick, I won't respond to you. But if you got something uh, relevant to say, even if you disagree, you know, if you if you word it in a respectful ish way. I will certainly uh, take the time to read your opinions and respond. Um, that's all I got for you. I guess I should throw a quick book plug out there. We're still doing that. The Gathering, a bold journey into the belly of the Juggalo underworld about a dude who goes to the Gathering of the Juggalos Music Festival. He hates it. He's grumpy the whole time, does a bunch of drugs, gets into a bunch of bullshit, and it's a fun little adventure. You can check that out on Audible, Amazon, and Kindle. However you like to read your books or hear your books, it's there. Just find it. And finally, another reminder to just like, follow, subscribe, TikTok, Facebook, Twitter, and, of course, YouTube as we climb our way to that 1,000 mark. And then I can just jump to the next level, merch, fucking other stuff live streams it's all coming we're, we're in it for the long haul here and i'm glad that you're here with me peace love and pizza i am your boy seth grimes and this has been the pro wrestling podcast podcast I hate juggalos. I fucking hate them. I say all this with a grain of salt because for a good part of my own life, I proudly identified as a juggalo. 
You should come to the gathering with me. Nah, man. I'm, I'm not into all that whoop whoop shit anymore. I'll pay for your ticket. I got fired today. Get the fuck out! Still got room for me? Spike, slow the fuck down! Cops! Fuck your sleep! Fuck your sleep! Fuck your sleep! The savages started closing in with their tiki torches and war paint. Shit! Run! You guys got a dead body here already? Even the aliens were throwing shade. It was pure panic and intense horror. There was a guy I saw got chopped in half. I had nothing left to go back to. You alive? <sighs> yep. The Gathering. A bold journey into the belly of the Juggalo Underworld.